Being slow. There it goes. There we go. There we go. Welcome to Garden Chatter, where we connect gardeners together. We have a great show tonight. We have a couple of gardeners on and bloggers and in just a moment we'll introduce them. Tonight our topic is gardening in small spaces and on a budget. So we're going to throw in some tips hopefully on some money saving things. Um, Bran, how can people engage with us and, <laughs> and find us? Well, tonight's going to be a lot of fun because I discovered today when you put the hashtag garden chatter in the search bar when you're logged into Facebook, you can see information about the event. So if you're on Facebook, just plug in the search bar hashtag garden chatter, all one word, and you'll see a link to this live stream. And feel free to ask questions on that. Um, if you're watching us live on the uh, Google Hangout right now. Just click right up on the right hand side there. You'll see a grid. Hit the grid and a question and answer spot will come up and say hi. Tell us how to grow in a small space. Um, also, we're on Twitter. <laughs> we're all over the place. Um, just engage in the conversation with us tonight on hashtag garden chatter. Did you get all that, girls and Adam? <laughs> yeah. I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get some people on and ask some questions. I mean, that's kind of the fun part of Google Hangouts is that you can have that live interaction. So we're really hoping people can jump on and at least say hi. So, Bren, who do we have tonight? Oh, my gosh, so much fun. Two great great gardeners. Um, I, I just love them because they're so engaging on social media. Uh, we have Aaron of BlackBerryBurrow.com. And we also have Michelle of uh, Behaving Badly. Um, maybe starting with Erin, can you tell us what hardiness zone you garden in? Uh, I garden in zone 7B up here in western Washington. And, um, you know, it's a very temperate area here. Uh, but we do have our challenges. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Michelle? I am in zone 6. I'm in central New Jersey. So... Yeah. Depending on, I guess, like what you consider central New Jersey, it's, it's, it is right in the center. It's above um, Route 95. So we have um, cold, but not quite as cold as like northwestern parts of New Jersey. Um, and that's, that's pretty much where I'm at. Okay. <laughs> We were joking that we weren't supposed to talk, well, Aaron and I, we're not supposed to talk too much about the weather right now because it's a <laughs> lot nicer on the West Coast than on the East Coast. So Go ahead. We'll we'll throw a virtual <laughs> snowball at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a snowball. <laughs> so, well, what, why don't we go ahead and um, Aaron and Michelle had shared some photos that they had taken during the summer of some of their garden areas and we're just going to go through and they can just give some quick commentary and then we'll move on to some some more discussion so let me share that screen and I'll jump over here. all right so this first one wait it's trying to run away with me come on <laughs> I didn't want the auto <laughs> That's okay. There a we go. Bit so, there Aaron, you, go. you want to just tell us a little bit about what what's going on on these? Yeah, that was in the backyard of one of our rentals in Ballard. Um, it started out as a sort of blackberry infested space, and we brought in a whole lot of compost, and we found some retaining walls underneath all of the blackberry vines, and we grew a vegetable garden there. There wasn't a whole lot of space, but um, as you can see, um, by growing our tomatoes up, we actually did add supports that went even higher later in the year. We were able to get quite a crop out of that garden. Wow. Is this the side? Because um, I, I noticed back over here there's some peas on the mm -hmm. left side. Is this sort of looking at it from another angle? Yeah, so I put that picture in there because uh, it was a good example of sort of dealing with sort of gardening in an urban area. That 
faced an alley and there was a lot of dust from cars and so we planted those poppies and bachelor's buttons there just as a way to sort of prevent the dust from coming into our garden and the neighbors enjoyed the flowers. Very nice. You're like the perfect neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Flowers to look at. Except for our cat who thinks that <laughs> all of the outdoors is her litter box. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> um, this was a this was another garden. This is a, actually in Bellingham. Our first year in Bellingham, we were uh, renting a little community garden space, and um, I just thought it was a good picture to show how closely the sort of artichoke was growing next to the peas. But they were all sort of very happy and healthy, um, no diseases or things like that. Cool. And then I guess jumping over to Michelle, you had um, some a pallet garden containers. Yes. Um, so the first season that I grew at this property, um, we planned out a raised bed, which you'll see in a couple slides later. But that um, is primarily in shade. And for what reason we did that, I have no idea. So <laughs> we had to come up with a new way to grow for um, stuff in the sun. So we uh, have access to a bunch of pallets and we have to raise up all of our pots because we do have a dog who likes to do things to the plants so we have to keep them up um, to where he can't get to them. And um, you'll see on the right hand side we have a whole bunch of potatoes growing and then there were tomatoes in the back and peppers and squash um, in there. And that is all in the sun. So those were sun-loving plants that we needed to relocate. All right, let's jump forward a little bit. <laughs> and then they grew, and it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they grew. Great. Very good. And you can actually see on some of the squash in the front, they started to get the powdery mildew, which is a big problem here in New Jersey with the humid summers. Um, mm -hmm. And then one thing gets it, and everything gets it. So it's like you have to try to combat that quickly, um, which I usually end up um, pruning and then moving. So I'll prune it all off and then I'll move that plant somewhere else so it's not infecting everything huh. within there. And then here's your raised bed. And this is our partial sun <laughs> shade raised bed, and um, which is great because you can grow, you know, carrots and peas and um, beans and like lettuces and stuff like that in and there's a lot of space. I think it's um, it's like 10 by 6 um, total space in there. So there's a lot of room and I do have a trellis that I try to grow cucumbers on but last year was not not a great year for that. Uh -huh. I actually threw in a couple photos here at the end. Um, I have some wine barrels that I've had on the south side of our house that gets pretty good sun exposure. And let me go ahead and jump to them. And so depending on, and like actually I wasn't supposed to talk about it, but today I was out planting some peas <laughs> and carrots in these. Um, it's been pretty warm and they're up off the ground and they're in you know the south side so they're nice and warm. Here I had potatoes, I had planted some tomatoes in between that uh, did okay. And then later I plant basil, and the basil absolutely loves it. I don't, you know, I'm just amazed um, how much heat the basil can take because on yeah. the south side of the house on a 100 degree day, I mean, it is just yeah. wow. scorching hot, but they just seem to love it. So I, I go ahead and get all my basil and I throw some petunias in there just for, just for fun. That's cool. You know, last night on Garden Chat, you just kind of made me think of that when you shared basil. Um, we talked about invasive plants. I didn't realize how hot of a topic that was. But I'm just curious with how you grow it, Adam, um, being up in a container like that, does that help at all with reseeding and, you know, invading, you know, issues? With the, the basil, you mean? or? Yeah, the, I'm sorry, the basil, having it yeah. in the container like that. Well, what usually happens is sometime in about May or early June I get some little volunteer basils okay. and sometimes I've already planted um, some in there so actually I welcome those that's not a problem okay. um, so sometimes I use them sometimes I've already planted you know basils that I started in my greenhouse or something in there and I don't need the little 
starts. But um, you know, it's really easy to keep it weeded and and the soil. Right. You know, they they grow really well in there. I just add some compost each year to kind of rejuvenate the pot a little bit. Very cool. Well, Aaron, what about and and Michelle? So if we're doing a small space garden and we need some soil, do you have any tips for getting soil or maybe some money saving on soil? Thoughts on that? Well, I mean, obviously you can always compost. Um, I do know that some communities that collect leaves will actually give compost out for free. Um, you just have to find those, those places. Um, but then you always do take the chances. You don't know what is in that compost. So doing your own is, is always better. Um, and reusing soil that you used, like if you have containers and stuff like that, I'll always reuse the soil um, by dumping it into my garden as long as I didn't have any problems with the plants that were planted in that. Uh, I'll dump it into the garden in the fall and then turn it all over in the spring in with the, with the garden bed. Yeah, like I was saying, I just usually, in, in my bigger pots, I'll just kind of add in some compost and just keep keep reusing it, and it seems like that works pretty well. Erin, did you, how do you uh, go about? Well, I thought that? it might be nice to, um, just a tip maybe for community gardeners, if you're in a garden patch where you're growing with a lot of other gardeners, um, one thing you might do is you can, you know, sort of order soil to be delivered and split the cost among all the gardeners is one way to do it. Um, certainly when you're living in an apartment, it can be an issue to sort of have, you know, to sort of create compost or things like that. Um, and so if you do decide to buy some soil to bring in, I would definitely look really carefully at the ingredients into the company that's producing it. Um, the city of Seattle creates their own compost out of city yard waste. Um, and so looking into maybe what your city has to offer, sort of like Michelle mentioned, might be a good way to start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brenda, do you have any, were you wondering about anything, Brenda? You had a couple of questions. Uh, no, I, it's neat to hear the, um, the how you just add a little bit more organic material or matter to the soil of these containers because that's basically what I've been doing in my raised beds. And I, I don't know if I'm doing it right, but I'm producing a uh, harvest and the soil looks great and I don't have any, I don't know, anything that doesn't look normal going on. So it's good to hear that... Um, you guys use that same technique. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's too much to just, for me anyway, to, you know, kind of try to replenish the entire, yeah. all the soil each year. So, um, and then any thoughts on how do you go about getting pots or do you find sources that are affordable in that regard if you're trying to just get started on a budget? Um, so I know that a lot of independent garden centers they um, receive back landscaping pots. So landscapers will come back and bring all the pots that they've bought plants in um, for to be recycled. Um, and a lot of those independent garden centers will give them to you for free. All you have to do is go in and say, do you have any free pots? And they'll give you pretty much whatever you need. So that's, that's where I get all of my pots from. <laughs> I don't think I... I you know, you buy the decorative cute pots, but then, you know, ones to grow potatoes, and I don't care what they look like, so that's usually where, <laughs> where I'll go. Yeah, that's, that's a good tip. I mean, I was thinking, like, when I go and buy um, trees and stuff, maybe to plant, they, sometimes they come in big pots, so I'm thinking probably another source would be, like, looking on Craigslist or something. I think a lot of times people, you know, they buy them, they plant them, but then they don't know what to do with them, so there's probably quite a few out there that could be... Right pretty much free. I'm just curious, um, since we're on the container issue here, um, or the subject of containers, um, I notice on my, you know, I do a lot of plantings and containers on my deck and whatnot, and so I'm in zone 5B, and even though it's like 10 degrees right now in the summer, you know, we can get up to um, 100, 90 degrees um, for a good week or so, and 
the wind, the wind is a really horrible factor on these containers, uh, not so much for you know affecting the structure of the plants, but for drying those containers out. Do either of you have any tips or ideas on keeping that soil moist in the summertime? Or you know, <laughs> either one of you. <laughs> Aaron? <laughs> are we? Yeah, sure. Are we talking um, soil in containers moist? Or are we talking soil in general moist in the summertime? Yeah, I mean, because like, like what, how Michelle shows, she's got her um, containers and they're kind of up on a pallet. You know, mm -hmm. when I have containers like that, just the, you know, it, it dries out quick. I have to water or, or, you know, do other things to it to, you know, help so I don't have to stay out there watering constantly. Do you have yeah. any ideas? Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. So it depends probably what you're growing in that container. If you were growing berries, for example, mm -hmm. something that's a really free and plentiful mulch, at least around here since we have so many evergreens, you can, if you can find a place that has a lot of pine needles or things like that, that you can, you know, around the base of trees, oftentimes I've dug up that kind of thing to mulch around the base of blueberries and things like that in containers. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they're going to acidify the soil, so that's better for berries or things like that. Um, another, you know, any kind of mulch really, you can do straw, you can even do, I mean, if you have newspaper. I always think of it as looking at junk critically when it comes to sort of saving money in the garden. Uh, you know, Adam mentioned looking on Craigslist. That was a huge source for me of hardscaping materials for um, my gardens over the years. Um, also, if you have any landscaper contractor friends, uh, they might have access to maybe they're pulling bricks out of someone's property or stones. Tree services sometimes, if you want bark mulch, they might be willing to dump a load of their sort of waste uh, bark kind of chips for free. We've had that at uh, both the community gardens I've gardened at. So really there are a lot of options for mulch. Sure. Uh, yeah, so you just you kind of have to look at whatever is plentiful and free and considered trash. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, in your in your neighborhood, that's that's the that's the twenty somethings or the the poor gardeners' uh, best friend, I think. Mm -hmm. How about you, Michelle? Do you have any tricks or tips or anything? Um, I'm just a waterer, so I'll water okay. every every day. Yeah, I don't. I haven't okay. really. Um, done any of mulching in the pots, but that's a really okay. great idea. So okay. Um, so I, I just want to add in really quick that Giovanna is on the question and answer and um, if you, I hope you follow Giovanna on Twitter because it's really neat in the summertime she lives in a small space and she's got lots of perennials and berries growing in containers on her um, smaller balcony that she has in the city um, but Giovanna wants to know is do you grow any perennials in your pots um, either of you and maybe start with Michelle no, actually perennials this year um, was a first for me and I did uh, quite a bit of planting them in the ground. So um, the only the only perennials that I do have in pots currently are blueberry bushes and they're container sized blueberry bushes. So we'll see how those do in the spring. Very cool. How about you, Erin? Erin just disappeared on us, so she'll be oh. back. <laughs> okay. That happens. <laughs> She vanished. She'll be back. Um, so let's see. Emily Murphy, she's on, and she hi Emily, and she hey. said, "What is your number one small space garden tip?" So maybe we can um, kind of bring that in too, and maybe Emily, you could um, share your number one small space garden tip back at us, and we'll we'll share that <laughs> loud. There you go. <laughs> you're you're back, Erin. Yeah, 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 sorry about that. That happened. That's okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, let's see, where were we? We were on talking about. I I jumped ahead because I wasn't sure how quick you were gonna come back. <laughs> uh, I think we you guys mentioned perennials and containers. Exactly. Uh, I was gonna say to Bren, um, yeah, uh, I I've often grown sort of things cottage garden style because I love perennials. I love flowers. Um, 
I have definitely, last year I planted a little patio pot with the pot, Michelle, from a nursery, a big pot, Monrovia pot from a nursery <laughs> that I got for free, and I covered it in burlap to make it look autumnal. I planted, let's see, a Hebe pimeloides quicksilver, a rainbow ascot euphorbia, a little heather in it, I think maybe it was creamer's rope, and a few pansies, and then I put some daffodils under it, and it was sort wow. of a, a pot. Yeah, I, you know, we were right on a busy street or apartment, and uh, I just wanted something kind of cheerful and seasonal, and it was great because um, I had planted queen of the night tulip in it and some daffodils, so then in the spring, sort of the floral display kind of continued, and I... I definitely think that you can grow perennials in containers. It's just a matter of making sure there's enough root space for things, which is, you know, we're gardeners. That's our thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering if, as far as um, a number one tip for small space gardening, I guess we could maybe kind of qualify that. Maybe we could do a number one tip for container gardening and a number one tip for just you know, small space in the ground because those tips might be a little bit different. So what about uh, container gardening? Any tips, I think, um, about container gardening? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'd say with container gardening, one of my main tips would be make sure that you use potting soil I, because it's not the same as garden soil and I know it seems really simplistic but having fresh healthy soil I think is really important you don't want to go to all the work of planting your container and make and having your plants sicken from soil that's not healthy and then my second major tip that can really be an issue that happens more often than people realize is making sure there's adequate drainage in your pot uh, a lot of plants can die from sort of overwatering or sitting in. Even if you have a big hole in your pot, if it's up flush against the ground or the patio that it's on, it may not be drained properly, and it maybe needs to be put on a couple pieces of um, wood or blocks of wood or something like that. So making sure you have good, healthy soil to start with and making sure you have adequate drainage would be my top two tips. Yeah, and I think those two things are a little bit related in that if you just put, you know, soil from your from the ground and it's not going to drain very well and that's part of the, the problem with using you know, it's just too yeah. heavy and doesn't drain well enough. Yeah. Michelle did you have any thoughts on uh, containers? Um, I guess my, my number one tip would be to definitely get the right size container for what you're growing. Um, I see too many times people pick smaller containers and then the plant becomes root bound or doesn't really thrive because it, there's not enough room for it. We're planting too much in one container um, is also a problem. Yeah, I, I've never done that, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've all done it, Adam. <laughs> That's, you know, why we I, know. That's why we know we need big containers. I know. It, you see what happens, right? I, I've also, there's a couple of good sites out there that have a guide um, for each different kinds of kind of vegetable and, and berries and stuff on what size container you should be planting it in. So that could be a handy oh, resource cool. to look at. Yeah. Um, well, any thoughts on how about a small space garden tip for in the ground? Well, um, in the in the raised beds that um, that I have, I try to do square foot gardening so I can fit as much as I can within the space. Um, so for that I have, I, my husband made me a template so that way I have exactly what size a square foot is. Um, and then my, when you're doing that, my tip would be to not overseed. So um, thinning has always been a major problem and you think you've thinned enough but you never thin enough and then you end up um, not really getting the harvest that you that you wanted. So. Sure. When you uh, when you say that your husband made you a template, what do you mean? Like, do you have a frame that you lay down, or are you sketching, or what do you mean by that? It's a, a frame that he made out of um, two by four, fours that have, Very cool. um, depending on what I'm planting, has different spaces. Mm -hmm. So, like, it'll be, um, you know, in eighths and then in sixteenths and and so forth, and there's removable pieces so that I can figure out 
what I'm doing. <laughs> right, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, small space gardening. I would say everything Michelle said, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, really paying attention to how far apart you plant things is so important in this kind of situation. When you look on the back of seed packets, often they have the spacing is for people that have, you know, sort of limitless amounts of acreage. And I've been really successful with, you know, just giving each plant just the amount that it needs to grow and be happy. You know, a, a broccoli really this much space, it's fine, it's happy. As long as you, you know, I practice double digging, I really make sure there's a lot of compost and amendment. I give it a lot of rich, you know, healthy soil and fertilizer. I, I fertilize during the season with seaweed fertilizer, that kind of thing, just to make sure that the plants get enough nutrients to really. And also, you know, another thing, and I'm not sure how this works out in different parts of the country, but, you know, really, at least in western Washington, there are several seasons that you're dealing with, and I'm sure the same is true for you in Oregon, Adam, where you know, you can plant your peas in the early spring, then you can take those out, uh, you know, sometime in June, and you can plant something else in the same space. And then, you know, oftentimes by the end of July, you're, you're putting another round of peas in, uh, which is not to mention even the things, you know, the greens that you can grow in the winter. So if you think of your garden, a lot of times people just traditionally think of the summer garden, but if you think of it in terms of seasons, like cool season, there's a cool season, and then there's you know a warm summer season, and then there's things that you can plant at the end of July to grow into autumn. Really, you can maximize your space exponentially. I mean, we have had very small spaces over the years, and we've eaten from them all through the summer and had enough to put up in jars and things at the end of the summer. I am. I'm a fan of how you have the different pots, the containers, because uh, one of the issues I have with growing in my small space, which happens to be a raised bed area, um, you know, I can't really just pick those up and move those and plant something different. So I don't know if you have any tips on where, where do you find, like, how do you know, okay, now get rid of the peas, pull the peas out compost them. Now I'm going to start my, I don't know, put a starter plant tomato in there or something. Do you have any tips on knowing like when when should we start putting new new things in? Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Michelle, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah. um, um, I would say like in terms of um, peas, I do like sugar snap peas. I know mm -hmm that um, once the temperature starts to get around 60 that mm -hmm. they start to to stop producing as much okay. so at that point I'll, I'll pull them out. Also watch your your frost dates and that's also a good indication of when uh, the weather is going to start being too warm for the, the cold crops. Okay. So. And if it's okay for me to bring up crop rotation, Adam, <laughs> <laughs> By all means, I, I, this is one of my one of my my favorite things. Um, my top two things that I have learned over the years. Number one was my friend Bill once told me that the best fertilizer is the farmer's shadow, which is the idea that you don't have to be in your garden for long periods of time, but if you're there a little bit every day, even if it's a pea patch that you have to drive to, uh, you can really keep an eye on your plants. And the other one in a small space is uh, crop rotation, kind of what Bren and Michelle were speaking to. And um, there's, there's a few different ways you can think of it. If you are planting the same family, uh, you know, if you're planting sort of all selenum crops, you know, tomatoes in the same, tomatoes or potatoes in the same space every year, most of us know that eventually you're going you're gonna to attract sort of pathogens and things that feed on that specific family. And so when you're planting, you know, by the season, usually what I try to do is I try to make sure that I plant a vegetable that's in a different family. And hmm. the other thing you can think about, so you're sort of rotating the families out. And another thing you can think about is heavy feeders versus light feeders. 
you know, broccoli, tomatoes, spinach, those take a lot out of the soil. And so after you've planted a crop like that, you might want to put a light feeder in, such as beets or carrots or lettuce. And in terms of, you know, so that's something to think about. You could do, like, if I was going to do an example, you know, say you started with snap peas, which is going to put nitrogen into the soil, and then you put a tomato in that spot. The tomato is going to love the nitrogen. Um, and then after the tomato, you know, you could put in some late season carrots and, you know, that would be a good progression of crops. And so just thinking about kind of, you know, what kind of families you're dealing with, uh, you know, kind of trying to keep things mixed up and, and don't really keep it in the family, I guess is what mm. I'm trying to say. <laughs> and that also will save you money on fertilizing. Hey. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and time. Well, that explains why my tiny toms did really well after I pulled the peas out with that miniature tomato in, and it was going crazy last year. So I've never, I mean, I live out in farmland, you know that, and I know about the crop rotation and big scale and kind of mimic it in my little area. But um, so, you know how you talk about these different plants? Where do, where can people learn about, like, have you written about that on your blog? I mean, I've never heard of that before. Does that well, make sense? Okay. Yeah, no, that does make sense. I have not written about it on my blog. Have you written about it on your blog, Michelle? No, sadly I have not. <laughs> I know. I, I definitely, I don't know what, what you're, you know, like, I definitely say any of my favorite garden books, like, garden books refer sure. to that. Um, let me see. I've got, sure. uh, here's a good one. Your well, there's an idea seed. for you. Y'all need to blog that because it's, oh, <laughs> that's a little a great boring. Idea. Here's okay. the, this one is for the Northwest. That's oh, a that's fun cool. one. Okay. Um, and then, and speaking also to frost dates, I was going to mention, you know, the internet mm -hmm. is a great resource for, usually if you look for your region and frost dates and planting calendar, you can find that a planting calendar online. Uh, okay. I apologize for people in different regions. I'm going to mention also Territorial Seeds has a lot of great information, their website yeah. on crop rotation. Um, but I can just mostly speak to the Northwest region. And also, if you look up um, online about succession planting, that will okay. also give you some good ideas as to what should go, what's in what family and what should follow. Oh, cool. Okay, so it's called succession, succession planting. Succession planting, succession, crop sorry, <laughs> Oh, no, that's a really good question, and that, that maybe okay. Michelle and I should Never heard that, that before. Yes, yes <laughs> please do. That, that's pretty cool. Mr. Pose, just saying. Yeah. And um, I think what Emily, so Emily Murphy, when she asked, um, she's, you know, uh, Emily, she's from PassThePistol.com, so she, she she asks what your number one small space garden tip. To me, I'm I'm thinking, you know, if I'm somebody new to gardening and all I have is a small space, and I'm thinking, uh, oh, you know, I can't do this. What would you guys say? I mean, who, you know, what would you tell someone who is new to gardening? Where, where should they start with a small space garden? I would say pick three things that you want to grow, and and do those three things and when you feel like you've mastered those three things pick a new three things and grow it that way because I think um, I know I've done it to where I'm like oh, I want to grow this and I want to grow this and I'm growing 20 different things I have no idea how to grow and then two of them are successful and the rest are not and then you feel like you failed so <laughs> if you work with three and you focus all of your energy on growing those three things successfully um, then you you have a like a greater spirit to want to to do it again and expand. Totally. How about you, Erin? Do you have a quick tip? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say that Michelle's tip is the best tip I've heard yet. Because usually, yeah. when I used to work at the nursery, that was the main thing I tried to get people to do is just to kind of start small. Um, because like she said, as we've all done, you start with 20 plants and then maybe two are successful. It's, you want to, you want to feel successful. So I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to say soil because my first garden that I ever planted when I was 14, um, my dad suggested I put some compost in and I ignored him and I ended up digging compost in around my sad spindly plants that weren't growing at all. 
And so I think I would suggest, you know, just to save yourself money and time, you can get a soil test through many of the universities, and it's easy to make, do a soil sample. Most of the Master Gardener's websites will show you how to do it. Send it in, then you'll know kind of what nutrients your soil needs so that you're not buying fertilizers that have nutrients that you don't actually even need in your garden. And, you know, make sure if you're growing vegetable and food crops, you know, I, I would definitely suggest some compost wherever you can find it or procure it. You know, gardeners are really generous people. One of the things I wanted to mention is just, you know, a lot of my plants in my early gardens were from friends or grandmothers or family members, you know, irises, a lot of these perennials, a lot of these vegetables, you know, you can get seeds or starts from other gardeners. And so if you tell other people, if you're a young person or you don't have a lot of money and you tell other people you're starting a garden, gardeners will be more than happy to provide you with probably more plant material than you can ever use in your space. Totally. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I was just thinking about soil and, you know, the I think a soil test is certainly a good idea, but also maybe just trying to grow something. I, I lived about three miles away from where I am now, and the soil was really just pretty amazing. It was just so easy to, mm -hmm. to grow things. And then I moved where I am now, about three miles from there, and the soil was terrible. And, it, you know, it's a completely different experience. So you, you might get lucky and have good soil. <laughs> it's not... Not for sure, but you um, could just give it a try and see how it goes with the, the three things that Michelle mentioned that first year and start okay. small. Um, let's see, Emily had another question that was kind of a fun one um, that we could throw at you really quick. Do you have a go-to uh, garden-to-table dish, one you love and rely on? putting you on the spot so <laughs> nothing's popping in your head that's <laughs> I've got one we had these um we went to the farmers market in Ballard once and they were selling these quesadillas that were loaded with like beet greens and kale and Ooh. just any sort of like er little bits of carrot any sort of early garden green that you could think of and they were delicious and a little bit of cheese and so ever since then when we first start to get we grow a lot of beets, like our beets and things in, and our kale will make like little veggie garden quesadillas with the fresh greens, and they're really tasty. Hmm. Very good. You better blog that recipe. That <laughs> sounds really good. I never thought of making a quesadilla out of that. Wow. I had not either. <laughs> Yummy. Yum. How about um, you, Michelle? <laughs> for me, it's it's pretty much salad because that is the, the quickest thing that I can grab out of the garden and put together. Um, other than that, it really depends on what's, what's growing and, and what isn't failing. So, <laughs> right. you know, like if, if, if I have a crazy amount of potatoes, then, um, then I have, you know, I'll make hash browns and right. eggs and potatoes and stuff like frittatas and stuff like that. So right. um, I think it depends on what's in season and um, what you have a ton, a ton of. Right. It's just salad. There's so many yummy salad varieties out there. <laughs> you can't say it's just salad. <laughs> it's <all so> tasty. <laughs> Seriously. I guess so. Um, I'm curious with seeds because, you know, I, I see a lot of people because, you know, seeds the hot topic right now in my garden centers and just everywhere you, you see the seed packet displays and, you know, you got the new gardener there and they're grabbing certain perennials and things that I'm just thinking in my head, ooh, they're going to try growing that in the, con the container. That is not going to work. Um, do you have a, a favorite seed that you like to start in your small space, uh, you know, just a favorite of yours that will be successful for any, you know, anyone for the most part. Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it did. <laughs> See, Aaron. <laughs> Ready, set, go. <laughs> Um, oh, well, <laughs> sorry. Well, for me, um, it would probably, it would definitely be cilantro because I find that to yeah. be really easy to grow from seed, um, and and that also will reseed itself. Awesome. So 
so that can be invasive as well. So you want to um, put that in a in a spot that you don't mind if it reseeds itself. But uh, but I I I would say that for kind of like early in the season, and then if you have um, a late in the season, it would definitely be carrots because those are really easy to grow as well. Great. I think my two favorites are probably, um, I love the red Russian kale. I like to eat it when the leaves are little and it's easy to grow, like, you know, Michelle was suggesting, and it's easy to grow and it's just really fun and pretty and it looks good in anything, mm -hmm. in a salad or whatever. And I really love beets and, you know, they're, you put them in the ground and they grow and you can eat the greens and you can eat the roots. So... Those would definitely be my two favorites. Uh, I, I'm curious, Michelle and Bren, because you guys have small spaces. One thing I've taken to doing uh, with the greens especially is I will sort of plant half a row and then two weeks later plant another half a row, which I my friend had suggested to me such that I always have sort of things ripening and um, I never left with like 40 heads of lettuce, which in a what are you going to do in your apartment with 40 heads of lettuce? Do you guys do that sort of successive planning yourselves kind of thing just to keep the harvest reasonable? I well, try to, but I <laughs> yeah. sometimes get mind that's my goal. But Usually I pack mine in so tight that if something's failing, the other thing kind of takes over and just harvest and eat it, and then it it's kind of like <laughs> survival of the fittest there. <laughs> Sorry. I, I wanna like it. I, I know we're running short on time here, but we, I wanna shout out Beth Billstrom on uh hello Beth. And um she wants to know what are your favorite herbs to grow in containers? We kinda touch base a little on that. Um do you wanna throw something out there again? Maybe Aaron? <laughs> I will not miss my cue this time. Rosemary. Okay. I like to grow rosemary. <laughs> it's awesome. You can put it in everything. It's the best. <laughs> And then, Michelle, you had mentioned doing cilantro from seed. Do you have another herb that you enjoy in the small space? Um, basil, definitely basil. And oregano, oregano as well. Awesome. I love parsley. Parsley is awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I'm voting for basil. <laughs> <laughs> Just All of those really things, well. really. I yeah. mean, herbs are great because... You yeah. know, instead of having that giant bundle from the store, you can just pick it a little bit at a time, which is really nice. Yeah. That's right. Well, wow. thank you so much for joining us. This has been really fun chatting with you, and there's some great ideas coming out of this. Um, let's see. Bren, where can um, we find <laughs> our guests, and where can we let people find us? Well, first of all, if you're watching the chat live right now, you can click on our Google, just hit our faces there, and please add us to a circle and refer back to um, the hashtag Garden Chatter for next week's topics. And also, please follow Erin. Erin's blog is blackberryburrow.com. And then, of course, Michelle is at behavingbadly.com. And I hope I gave you guys some good content there. And You need to blog about the succession plan and uh, how fun. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Well, we'll wrap with that. <laughs>